Policy Exchange. My name is Dean Godson, Director of Policy Exchange. I have the pleasure of uh, being your host today at this most ecumenical event ever in the history of the organization. And uh, it's a particular pleasure to uh, welcome this uh, cast, all of whom have played so significant a part through many years and different phases of our national life on uh, this vital question. The book uh, in hand, of course, is uh, Christopher Tugendhat's fascinating uh, new volume, The Worm in the Rose, The History of uh, Conservatives uh, in Europe. And uh, they will, our guests, will, our panelists will speak uh, today, Christopher Tugendhat first, followed by all of our other distinguished guests, and then we'll throw it open to the floor uh, for discussion. Christopher, thank you for letting us host the first of the uh, launch events for this most uh, important work. Always welcome on our platform. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. Please join me in expressing appreciation to our guests. Well, ladies and gentlemen, 50 years ago this year, as a young MP, I voted enthusiastically for Britain to, for the European Communities Bill that enabled Britain to join the EC. And then in 2016, um, I voted again uh, very enthusiastically uh, for Britain to remain a member. So this episode in our history has been part of my lived experience, but I'm not not in the book, making the case uh, for remaining in, let alone for coming out. What I'm trying to do is to write a first draft of history. This has been part of my life for the last 50 years. 10 years before that, I was on the Financial Times uh, in the office next to the chap who was covering the Macmillan negotiations. So what I've sought to do is to write a first draft of history and to explain as objectively as I as I have been able to do, why the party that took us in became the party that took us out, to explain what, how it was that a deep, grumbling discontent, the worm in the apple of my title, over time turned the party, and by extension the significant proportion of British public opinion, against uh, membership of the EU. The failure of the project was not inevitable. The result of the referendum was in doubt till the very end. If various decisions, personality clashes, judgments and events had turned out differently over the years, so might the final outcome. But what I will try and do is to identify what to me are the most important of the issues that undermine the project and that reach their apotheosis under Cameron. I want to show that those issues that reached their apotheosis under Cameron had their origins a very long time ago. I also want to show how, from the very outset, there were certain issues that were an endemic source of trouble. It's taken, an, uh, it's taken me a book to do that. And in the space of 10 minutes, which I will rigorously comply with, it will be no, it, difficult for me to give the balance of the book and to do more than a taster. But I begin with a very simple fact, and one that is easy to overlook. And that is that the European Union is the only international organization of which Britain has ever been a member, of which it was not an influential founder member. In the United Nations, the IMF, NATO, the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, the World Trade Organization, Britain was not just a member, but an influential founder member. That wasn't, of course, the case. We rejected the opportunity to join the, what became the EU at the beginning. And so when we did join, we found that it was based on principles and clothed in language and imagery with which we were unfamiliar and indeed often felt uncomfortable. And not only that, because we joined when we did, there had been two policies established um, with which, which created very real difficulties for us. That one was the common agricultural policy and the other was the system of own resources for, for financing the budget. Had we been in at the beginning, those policies would undoubtedly have been very different. But 
that we weren't in at the beginning, and that there was a very great difficulty in adjusting to those two policies. There then came two errors that were to have profound consequences. The first was by Ted Heath, of whom I've always been a very great admirer, and the second was by President uh, Giscard of France and Chancellor Schmidt of West Germany. And Ted's mistake um, was to ignore the advice that he had received from Harold Macmillan's Lord Chancellor, Lord Kilmuir, to come clean with the British people about the full implications of membership for sovereignty, parliament, the courts, and so forth. Kilmuir was a strong advocate of joining, and he wanted very, he'd been a, 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 an architect of the Convention on Human Rights. He was strongly in favor of his joining the EU, but he believed that unless those issues were dealt with absolutely out in the open at the very outset, they would come back to haunt us and how, how right he was. And this is the fact that they were not dealt with clearly at the beginning was something which constantly recurred during our time as members. During the referendum campaign in 1975, um, Enoch Powell and uh, Tony Benn and Jack Jones and Ian Paisley all raised the issue of sovereignty, but at that time nobody was very interested in it, and in any case those individuals were personally very distrusted. If Heath had raised it at that time, I think the argument would have been very clearly won. But at that time, people were much more concerned with economics. Um, they were much more concerned with um, the EU being a sort of civilian counterpoint uh, to NATO, and the opportunity was missed. The second big mistake was by Schmidt and Giscard when Mrs. Thatcher became, uh, became Prime Minister. There was a, a British budget problem. It existed, it was objective, it was there. And what I believe as the two leading figures in the EU, Schmidt and Giscard, should have done was to take her on one side and to say there's a problem and we've got to sort it out. And instead, they put her up against a wall and made her fight. And they didn't take her seriously. Well, of course, that turned out from their point of view uh, and from other points of view too in some ways, uh, to be a disaster because she fought extremely successfully. She got a better deal than it, where anybody thought might be possible. But the result was to embed in the minds of the British people and in the minds of the British media a conflictual view of um, Britain's relationship with the EU. Instead of seeing it as a continuous negotiation with fluctuating alliances, and people pursuing different objectives at different times, it, tended to, it came to be seen as us against them, one against the rest. And, and that, that, that image um, was embedded and remained. And it became further entrenched when Jacques Delors made, I think, the very big mistake of going to the TUC conference in order to set out his views on a, on a social Europe. They were, he did so in a manner that appeared to suggest that he was challenging the domestic program that Margaret Thatcher had pursued uh, very successfully uh, during her time in office. And he did so, you know, in the lair of her chief opponents, as it were. And that, of course, led to the Bruges speech. The Bruges speech was a very important speech, not only because she set the limits to what she regarded as British involvement, but of course also because she absolutely, um, ab absolutely demonstrated her commitment to British membership of the EU and also her commitment to the enlargement of the EU to bring in the countries of Eastern Europe. John Major made a determined attempt to get things back onto an even keel. And his Maastricht deal was um, hailed as a triumph by virtually everybody on all sides of politics in this country. And then there was another terrible error, and it was very easy to make, and that was that the bill wasn't taken through Parliament before the 1992 election. It was 
wait, the business managers decided that they'd wait until after the, 90, after the 1992 election. And by th then came the Danish referendum, and suddenly the whole thrust of the Maastricht Agreement looked as if it had been knocked off course. And Maastricht became a synonym for the most dreadful form of parliamentary battle. And then came the Black Wednesday. And although the membership of the, of the exchange rate mechanism had been extremely successful in bringing down inflation and enabled first Norman Lamont and then Ken to ha pursue one of the most successful periods of British economic policy that there has been since the war. The Black Wednesday itself was um, seen by many as a sort of economic version of Ceres. And it was at that point that Vernon Bogdaner has argued that Europe became delegitimized in the minds of many people in the Conservative Party. And the Conservative Party became more and more open to the idea of leaving. And of course, another factor that is not to be forgotten is that during the period that Margaret Thatcher had been Prime Minister and when combat had been the name of the game, constituencies tended to adopt their uh, candidates who were more and more of that, of that way of thinking. Now, all these issues became caught up in the debate over referenda. The idea of a referendum was launched by Margaret Thatcher in the run-up to the Maastricht uh, negotiations when she said, demanded that there should be a, should be a, a referendum uh, before we join the single currency. And that became a leitmotif um, of British politics, the idea of a referendum before we join the single currency. Well, of course, we never applied to join the single currency. Then you had the promise of a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, uh, again, promised by, by Blair, but uh, also supported by the Conservative Party. And there should have been, perhaps, one on the Lisbon Treaty. Blair said there was no need for one because France and the Netherlands had voted against. But Luxembourg went ahead and had their referendum. And they voted for, of course. And we would have voted against. But people would have had a say. Then there was the broken promise over the referendum on the uh, Lisbon Treaty. Uh, so you had those three issues. And then, increasingly, you had parties um, saying that there should be referenda, including the Lib Dems, on a transfer of powers. So by the time Cameron became prime minister, there'd been a huge build-up of steam about a referendum, and yet one had never taken place. And had one taken place, it might well have been possible not to have one on the, on the existential issue. The other problems which Ca Cameron inherited was, of course, the decision in 2004 uh, to allow unrestricted immigration from the new member states, something which the other member states did not do. They took advantage of a derogation. So you had the link between unrestricted immigration and Europe, a link which proved to be an extremely toxic one, especially in the light of Cameron's extremely unwise promise to bring, to bring, uh, to bring immigration down. And then there was the rise of UKIP. UKIP influence, I think, is extremely important in two respects. One is that by the successes in European elections, it was able to become a, a visible and prominent force in the British political system. And the second was that because Cameron never sought to defend the European Union, because Cameron never made the case for the European Union until the Bloomberg speech, because he never made the case for the European Union, UKIP defined the terms of the argument on the centre-right and right of politics. And, and it became a magnet for people, or some people, within the Conservative Party. And Cameron found himself facing a situation in which the membership of the party and the membership of constituency associations was being drawn increasingly in that direction. So he came to power 
on the one hand, wishing Britain to remain a member of the European Union, and on the other, never having made the case for that to happen. He never made a clear, convincing case based on shared values, common purpose, common interests, and so forth, and instead tried to stop the party banging on about Europe and leaving it to UKIP to do that. Now, this, I think, left him in a very vulnerable position when he decided that it would be necessary to, to, to tackle the issue of the referendum. And then he <coughs> thought that he could do what Harold Wilson had done and restructure the terms of, of British membership. And here, too, he made two errors. One of the interesting things about Harold Wilson was that although Harold Wilson wanted Britain to stay in the European Union, he never actually, he never actually committed himself to it. He did not put his own reputation on the, on the line. He left it, um, he, he left, uh, left it to the pros and the antis to fight it out. And Cameron came out in favour, and he was not a, a credible champion after his earlier performances. Whereas the Conservatives who were leading the anti-side were in line with the way in which the party had moved over, over the previous 30 years. So that, very briefly, is what I have tried to explain in my book. Why it is the party that took us in became the party that took us out. There's a great deal more than that. Mm -hmm. I hope I haven't rushed things through too quickly. experience of what I like to think a period which started in 1914 and ended in 1945. So I, I, I did not think that when I arrived in Manchester Airport on the 18th of January 1974 that in 2016 I would be uh, leaving, uh, <laughs> be heading up the Leave campaign. And I have never was what I would regard myself as an anti-European. I kind of, I, uh, I, I genetically haven't got it, I'm sorry. But can I can just take you back to, to some of these th things? The underlying assumption of the whole book is that what is the project? Now, I'm not sure, uh, Christopher, what you think the project was. To me and my generation, the project was to ensure that Germany and France would never go to war again, please. Uh, and could that be done? 
could, could you have a very, very deep political integration, which is achieved to begin with by economic integration, which will link together the, the original six, and, and you could at that stage even argue whether Italy should have been there, but there were historic reasons. And to me and to my generation, uh, it felt very much that you could probably, if you wanted a, a defense union and a single currency, Austria, Denmark, there were kind of geographic limiting which would have made sense. The surprise to me was that when the United Kingdom joined in 1973, it deprived the rest of, the Europe, of, of nation states in Europe a choice as to how it wished to de uh, uh, relate to its neighbors. Because by us joining the common market, we, in essence, destroyed EFTA. And therefore, the only relationship to, to a country, and that is also relevant in 2004 when the former communist countries had a choice, the only option you had was a political project that wanted to achieve political integration by economic means. And I would argue that in 50 years' time, it will be regarded as more remarkable that the United Kingdom joined the common market in 1973 rather than that he decided to leave in 2016. Uh, because it goes back to what the project is and what the project was. And if you really want to argue that for 50 years this is a continuous string of mistakes, missed opportunities and errors, I would have hoped that there were some time bits where people actually got it right. Uh, uh, but, but maybe they really don't. But uh, I just want to look ahead a, a little bit and just say where, where our challenges are. I think the bit which the Conservative Party is completely overlooking in when it talks about Europe uh, and what, what the debate of Europe has done to the party, I think the real challenge the, 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 the modern Conservative Party has to ask itself is, does it speak for England? And how do you speak for England? Uh, you have got a highly, you, you have a, a United Kingdom that devolved quite considerably in terms of powers uh, to, to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It devolved powers to London. What happened to the last, or what happened to the rest of England? And I would suggest that that is where UKIP's real uh, attraction was for many people. And where I hope the future is, and I just want to uh, uh, finish with, 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 with one, one thought. In 2016, when David Cameron uh, called the referendum, and uh, it is true that he thought he could deal with the problem by not talking about it, but let's not forget, Labour was divided over uh, the European Union as well. And by the way, Christopher, it was a very Jacques Delors speech <laughs> to the TUC, where suddenly Europe was giving the workers equal pay and all those things, which turned out in some way very sceptical Labour Party to a, a social Europe. Uh, so both political parties have been struggling with, with, with the project for different reasons and in different ways. But I would just sort of, if, 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 if you look where we, in, in 2016, uh, David Cameron called the, the, the referendum. And believe it or not, I really did not want to get him off. I was going, you know, I wanted the referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, which would have been the right thing to do because you had the status quo and you had the option for the future. 2016 comes, and I paused and I said, what would it have required for me to be on the other side of the argument and campaign for Remain? And the key thing for me was that in 1999, 2000, when you introduced the single currency, you crystallized the question that had been tried to be ignored for a very long time, i.e., could you have such a thing as a two-speed Europe, which was not only two-speed, but also two different destinations? Uh, with the introduction of the single currency, you did require a deeper political integration. And if David Cameron had come back with a deal which said, it is not a question of opt-out, it is a question of our future construction of the architecture of the European Union, there will be a core that has a single currency and has got a deeper political integration, and there will be a periphery which has got a different relationship, which will be your United Kingdom, your Poland, and I would have said, yeah. Let's go and give it a go. You go. He did not come back with that. And therefore, for me, the campaign to leave was I refused to endorse a model that showed no insights in the fact that its original project, at its foundation, had actually been achieved, that the limits of widening and deepening had also been reached, and it was incapable of adapting to it. So um, 
you may not like the, the butterfly it turned into. Uh, I, I'm not so critical of the, uh, the United Kingdom in a sense. I think it has shaped the European Union. But the future is going to be the interesting thing. And also remember, the one group of people in between the years of 2016 and 19, which probably in reflection would be seen an enormously, <coughs> enormous upheaval, one group of people who did not change their mind actually were the voters. And we as the politicians really need to reflect on why that was the case. Thank you. All Clark of Nottingham, most welcome. A first, thank you for coming. You're here. A first what? A first visit to this... Uh, yeah, yeah, August uh, establishment. Yes, so we're, right. we're delighted. I'm delighted to be here, particularly for this book. Uh, okay, well, can I firstly just, uh, just comment on the book itself, which I've almost completed reading. Uh, it, it is an extremely clear, uh, very, very brisk, very readable narrative of the events of the last 50 years. And it, it is a, a first draft of history, as Christopher says, uh, because uh, it's anybody who... Uh, looks at the events of the last 50 years in the United Kingdom, uh, from the, as far as the political world is concerned, will find it was totally dominated by Britain's relationship, uh, first its creation and then its breakdown by the EU. And the entire political career of Chris Tugendhat and myself has been dominated uh, by, uh, firstly, the whole issue of Britain and the EU, and also by the division within the party that we joined, which throughout has been uh, a discomfort on the question of Europe, um, which eventually exploded uh, in the referendum and the emergence of the Johnson government. Uh, and, uh, and I can't read it. If I'm therefore a rather partial reader, I read it. Uh, it doesn't give, tell me many events that I don't know. I, it prompts my memory a lot. But it is an approachable, very, very readable account and overview and analysis of those events that I didn't find a, what I regard as a factual inaccuracy at any stage throughout it. It is a very, very clear, brisk uh, narrative. I'm glad that it is because I hope it sells well and I, uh, it will appear to uh, the political world uh, we're still immersed in Europe and uh, will buy it. I hope it, the general public, but I'm a little more cautious about that because Europe's always mattered more to the political world, the political bubble, that it has to the general public. Uh, most of that time, it was not Europe was not regarded as uh, the most important subject in British politics, usually by far, uh, by the public as a whole. And I find at the moment, with the saga over for the time being, that, that the public have switched off again. I never use the word Brexit in conversation, except now I'm here at this event of policy exchange, because it just turns people off. Uh, if I wish to have my views listened to, I don't want people shaking their heads saying, oh, the old Ramona, he's still arguing it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, the public, uh, uh, that's what actually brought Boris to power on the pledge of getting Brexit done. Most the public didn't really matter which way he got it done. <laughs> and we didn't take very much care of it either. Uh, but they, 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 it, 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 it's not a subject that they ever got engaged with. And one of the problems is the complexities of the political issues and the institutions and so on were never really explained to the British public. Uh, I don't think this day the majority of the non-political public really could explain to you what the difference is between the Council of Ministers and the European Commission and what the respective roles are of both and how the European Parliament fits in, let alone the minutiae of common policies which are thrashed out very long, uh, 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 detailed uh, de de meetings and negotiations between the various ministers and member states. It's all the, it remains a bit of a mystery, and for the general public, it's faded into the past, but it very much marked the politics of half a century, and it, it, will, it has made a mark on British role in the world, and it will continue to do so, the whole experience. Um, the other thing I, I, I would add by way of Chris comments, uh, he makes points about what he and he made them, uh, he, he said to be in the book, about what were the key moments, and uh, I agree with that. The, 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 I, the other reflections I have about what the overall dispute, what it was all about, both parties were divided from the very beginning. I, I, I think it, 
it, you know, it, it, the fact that the issue never matched the British party political divide was crucial. In the end, critical to the Conservative Party, the Labour Party got over it because uh, Jacques Delors converted them by the speech that has been described. I agree with that entirely. It had the most remarkable effect on the Labour movement. But from the very word go, it was the tendency, with very important personal exceptions on both sides, for the, the right wing of the Conservative Party and the left wing of the Labour Party to be anti-European and the centre-right and the centre-left to be pro. That was true even before we joined, and certainly when we joined. Um, what, 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 one of uh, one of my uh, minor roles in all this all the way through, uh, one of my first critical roles when I first entered government was into the whip's office of Ted Heath, uh, where, which I did, having been PPS to Geoffrey Howe, who I was just beginning to handle the European Communities Bill. And I was made a whip, and one of my roles in the whip's office uh, was to be the whip helping keep a majority together for the European Communities Bill. Well, as a way of growing up politically and finding out more about how politics works and how government works, I couldn't have had a, a, a more, firstly, important uh, occasion to actually learn my, my, what my trade was really about, uh, but, but also to find out what Parliament was like. Uh, the, the, the division, the, the leading players on both sides uh, were Heath, supported very strongly by people like McLeod and Aldrich and so on, on the one side, and the Jenkinsites on the other, led by Roy. And the leading opponents of our entry and the leading opponents of the bill uh, were Enoch Powell, Michael Foote, and Tony Benn. All of them, certainly the last three, uh, all brilliant orators, the best orators in the House of Commons were Powell, uh, Foote, and Ben. Uh, but their, their respective followers, not exclusively, there were moderates on both sides who didn't fit this picture. Uh, I, I never described Gisela as the hard left. She, she's a very clear personal exception to my broad brush description. <laughs> but from the word go, the party was going. There was never a Conservative parliamentary majority in the Commons for the European Communities Bill. Uh, we, we required uh, the support in the voting principle and the abstention of enough in the committee stage of the Jenkinsites to get the bill through. Uh, and one of my roles was quite an intelligent one, was uh, negotiating, the other people were doing some of the same thing, but negotiating with a young member on the Labour side how many people we wanted to stay away of the Labour pro-Europeans tomorrow because of the scale of the rebellion we were expecting. And uh, there were six people who weren't standing the next election who voted with us all the way through, six Labour guys, but otherwise they took it in turns to avoid being deselected by their associations to go away. And uh, we'd suck our teeth and negotiate, and I think I was partly responsible with the other guy, whose name I'm afraid now slips my mind. I knew him extremely well at the time. We got down to it. We nearly made a mistake, and we got down to a majority of four at one point. Anyway, I've made my point. Uh, the parties ever thereafter remained divided. The Labour Party got more unitedly pro-European when they were persuaded that the social chapter made the uh, European project particularly suitable for them. Um, the other thing I would mention, which it actually didn't mention in the book, which I found throughout the 50 years was a particular handicap to people like me, enthusiastic uh, supporters of the European Union, uh, 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 is that for the second half of the time, we never had a pro-European newspaper, a conservative newspaper. Uh, I. I I don't overrate newspapers. I think politics now is dominated by the newspapers when they're uh, politically almost, otherwise almost extinct. But in the days of mass circulation, it used to be quite useful to have a newspaper that supported you. Once Conrad Black bought the Daily Telegraph, um, Murdoch acquired the Times and, and the rest, 
But there was never any such thing as a conservative pro-European newspaper uh, to be read by the conservative faithful uh, for, for the second half of our membership of the EU. I think they were all acquired in the 80s. And, and uh, that, 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 uh, that was also a feature. Now, I'm sorry, what I missed, I'm going back, going back to the start. The nature of the division in the Conservative Party was the same all the way through. It was even before we started. The pro-Europeans didn't all share the same reason for joining. Mm. Uh, for Ted Heath and his generation, it said always said it was a political project, and it was to stop nations going to war again, and actually to get them so interbound with common economic interests that their national political interests would be bound together as well. Ted may have been a federalist. There weren't many conservative federalists, I don't think, ever. So the founding fathers had been, but uh, but but he, he he certainly did see it binding together countries otherwise gone to war. Uh, for Margaret Thatcher, who was a keen pro-European, uh, I, I not only knew her as a colleague who worked with her, for, but I worked with her quite closely because I education was one of my things. I did as a whip when she was the education secretary. And I was on her front bench from the moment she took the leadership to the moment she, unfortunately, uh, rather tragically, um, was induced to resign. Uh, 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 and uh, she was equally pro-European, but for her, it was free trade. It was economics. Uh, it, 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 it was, uh, and that, that was it. Uh, and it also, cooperation on defence and foreign affairs. She saw the political point of enhancing our power, but from the word go, she never contemplated other erosions of our national sovereignty. And as time went on, she got ever more fearful that the wicked, there were wicked people in other countries who were trying to challenge the existence of the nation state, which she was ferociously against any attempt to erode our sovereignty, except to the extent that any treaty arrangement of any kind erodes on your sovereignty. The people who now get primitively excited about national sovereignty should have a look at the NATO treaty, uh, if they're that concerned, which has a massive surrender of sovereignty. And you don't sign a treaty without actually foregoing your sovereign right to do something as part of, 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 of the deal. Finally, I, because I'm running out of time, I, I warm to the theme and I can go on forever, as has always been my practice. Um, what turned it poisonous and gave a, 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 it was the beginning of the end, was the change that occurred to Thatcher. Thatcher's role was crucial, as was the fall of Thatcher in turning the European division into what utterly, ultimately proved fatal to our membership. We, we would never have left the European Union if events had not panned out as they occurred in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and it's already been destroyed. Well, at least the first occasion, uh, which was the battle over getting our money back, when Margaret found herself isolated, alienated, and the whole thing began to appear in this country, certainly to be mild Eurosceptics as a battle between the British and our enemies trying to undermine our independence and sovereignty in Brussels. I would add that I think one reason, Chris touches on this in the book, was the way Margaret, they tried to patronize Margaret from the very word go. Uh, I think uh, the Conservative Party and the United Kingdom has been very forward in having female prime ministers and female leadership and female partnerships. I think continental Europe wasn't quite ready for it. <laughs> I already mentioned uh, the, the problems you had with Schmidt and uh, I, I think both Mitron and Cole patronized her. They, they, they weren't really, they didn't quite take her seriously because, you know, she was a woman. Uh, and, and they were proper leaders of countries. Uh, and the personal relationship, which because of the jobs I was then in, I was able to observe quite closely. I went to summits and things and so on. They really could not stand each other. All attempts to get Thatcher and Cole closer together would lead to disaster uh, because they were totally 
at odds. And Margaret became more and more alienated the whole project, uh, and, and certainly was blocking uh, any further progress of the sort uh, they, they wanted. Although Margaret Thatcher w was never a Brexiteer. I never heard her even contemplate leaving, but she was quite determined to stop this Federalist plot to turn it, take it any further erosion of the nation state. After that, to Maastricht and on, the atmosphere in the Conservative Party changed, and it was poisoned. The poison erupted in the Maastricht Treaty debates, which took far too long and were far too bitter. They were bitter because it was revenge for Margaret. It was by now a passionate issue. And on, on we went, and I went to analyze uh, any further, except eventually David Cameron, who never defended Europe, although he was a very passionate pro-European, because it annoyed the, the Europeans. For party management reasons, just as same reasons that Wilson had called the first referendum, finally gave in to them to call a referendum, as he told me when I argued ferociously with him, oh, to get the, stop the party banging on about Europe and to get rid of it before the election. Never occurred to him he might lose it. He should have had Chris's book in front of him. Uh, he would have realized what he was opening up by calling a referendum. The Eurosceptics always demanded a referendum because they knew they'd never get leaving through Parliament. Jimmy Goldsmith uh, for organized the first party to get round the fact that you were never ever in a thousand years going to get a parliamentary majority in favor of leaving the European Union. A referendum was the only way. Cameron, for misguided management reasons, gave him a referendum and ran an absolutely awful campaign which didn't even try to defend the merits or explain the advantages of membership, uh, but just actually went on about it. there'd be an economic recession if we made the mistake of leaving. And uh, it was as dishonest as the campaign on the other side. After three weeks of trivial campaigning, David Frost was left with the problem of deciding what exactly Brexit meant and how we sorted it out. And no doubt he'll now tell us. But uh, the book <laughs> is a fascinating guide to what was a central, central feature of British politics for a very important half a century. Sadly, I think leaving is just one of those features of the collapse of many things of that half century. I'm disillusioned, I think. I, I, I assumed we were established a rules-based international order, a globalized economy in which internet, worldwide prosperity would steadily grow as the developed countries joined us, and the principles of liberal democracy and the rule of law would steadily become established. All that seemed practically there, or getting nearer in the 1990s and 2000s, leaving the EU and threatening the EU, just the latest step in what at the moment is a very worrying challenge, that whole idea which is going backwards. Thank you. Pleasure now to call on our last panelist, Lord Frost of uh, Allentown. Uh, for those who haven't uh, read it, uh, we published a few months ago a chronology of the first phase of the negotiations on the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, with a forward by Lord Frost. I commend it to all of you still the authoritative statement on that phase of negotiations with more to come. More than welcome here, David. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, so, obviously, I'm not a uh, a politician, really. I, I've kind of drifted into politics in the last couple of years, and, and who knows how long for. Um, but I experience these events in a in a different way, I think, from from everybody else in the panel watching it as a as a civil servant, as a diplomat. Um, I think gave me more of a glimpse of the of the kind of wiring of the way the EU worked, uh, more of a glimpse of. The debates from a different perspective, but it is an ex it's an extremely interesting book. I very much enjoyed reading it, and um, uh, I agree. I recognise the the picture that's painted from my my perspective. Um, I think there are a few, a couple of things that are, are left out, as it were, which I'll I'll mention um, as I as I talk. But maybe just sort of four or five comments, really, because a lot has been said already about the history of of these years. Um, 
First point, I'm not sure I agree with, with Lord Sugenhad that um, if we'd been at the start, in at the start, it would all have been different. Um, obviously, these things are unknowable, uh, but nevertheless, I, well, I think it's probably only true if we'd been able to stop the EU developing at all and it had already, always remained something like EFTA. Uh, I don't think that was ever going to happen, and I don't think it was within our power, even in the, the 50s, to stop it. Uh, the strength of Franco-German reconciliation, the strength of that bargain, the push to supranationality, the wish for the small states to have a system that protected their interests. I think those were extremely strong forces, and I, I, I don't think we could have changed this community into something completely different if we'd been there from the start. I think it's, it's the sort of might have been that never was, uh, if, if you like. Um, I also don't quite agree with the argument that um, unfamiliarity with the way that it works matters. I agree nobody um, in the street understands the Commission or the Council or any of those things, but um, you know, if you ask people in the street, they won't have a very good idea of how a bill goes through Parliament either here in Westminster or the nuts and bolts of lawmaking or very much how politics works. But it's about legitimacy of the system. It's about do you trust it, do you have confidence in it, do you think it will work? And um, we have that to, to a degree at the moment in Westminster. I don't think we ever really had it properly uh, in Brussels, and that's part of the problem. The second point, I think... If I'm honest, I think the book has a slight we was robbed feel to it. That uh, you know, a lot of really good arguments somehow never took. Um, you know, self-evidently correct opinions about the world that were sort of faced down by hostile press or crazy Tory right wingers uh, or the sort of fruitcakes in UKIP or whatever. All these things got in the way of something that was obviously. Correct, and I think that world view is part of the reason why the referendum was lost in the end. Uh, there was a failure to take the Leave campaign and that constituency seriously. I think also within the Conservative Party, and I, I speak under correction, obviously, but I think the failure to agree to take seriously issues that historically have been an extremely important part of Conservative Party ideology and. Um, identity turned out to be important. I issues like the UK constitution, the nation state, how foreign policy is determined, national identity, self-government, all those things have been historically very important to the Conservative Party and if like, they, they weren't taken seriously and I think that was probably one of the, the reasons why uh, things developed as they did. Um, third point, I think uh, David Cameron, obviously we owe him a debt for making the referendum possible. Um, but I do think he, as, as I think Postle was delicately hinted at, um, it, he never really realised how out of touch he was with the way public opinion was, was going by in, in the last few years. And I think the idea that the, the referendum, the, the renegotiation, so-called, that he conducted could ever have been acceptable illustrates that. So I think, you know, if, if it was ever going to be acceptable, I agree with Gies, there had to be something much more fundamental that, that reordered things uh, in a way that was different for the future. And uh, that was never on offer. Uh, it never seemed possible. And I think that's the moment when many people kind of change their minds uh, about this. By the way, it's, I think one of the reasons why the application by Ukraine and some others is, is going to prove quite complicated for the EU to handle, because they obviously don't want to say no, but obviously equally Ukraine doesn't remotely come near to the traditional criteria that have been applied to, to EU membership. But if, if they end up offering some sort of political European status to Ukraine that doesn't have any actual obligation, then why is that not an offer for others as well? I think it opens actually quite a lot of dilemmas for the EU that they're only beginning to, to think about. Um, I also think it's a bit of a fallacy that um, greater leadership from the Conservative Party, whether it's Cameron or, or whoever, could have changed the way the arguments worked. Um, I don't think the British people, certainly in the last decade, have been waiting to be persuaded. It's clear that there's only about 15 to 20% of public opinion is really strongly pro 
European and believes in the project. It's also obvious that the UK vision of the EU was not shared by others in the EU. So it was always a pretty hard sell to say, if you believe in it harder, uh, then it's all going to work. You know, sort of Peter Pan version of um, uh, EU politics. I just don't think that was on offer, and I don't think it could have worked. Um, so, so there we are. Fourth, um, one of the things that's not in the book, and reasonably enough, because it's, it's about the Conservative Party, not about everything that happened in the last 50 years, but, but I think what I remember from the last five or six years before the referendum was increasing alarm, bemusement, concern at the way the EU itself was behaving. If you look at the way it treated Greece, Cyprus in the, the, the Euro crisis, the sense that they created a, a kind of monster in the Euro but didn't really know how to, to deal with it, the way one, the, the EU has encouraged one Italian Prime Minister after another to be replaced without having a sort of proper electoral process for it, uh, the fact it's reversed one referendum after another. I think the way the EU behaved in those, those years actually was a big part of the story in turning people against the project and the way it was going. And I, I think that maybe isn't brought out as much in the book as, uh, uh, as, it, as it could have been. Um, final point, um, uh, the post-referendum activity um, that Lou Clark touched on. Uh, reasonably enough, the book doesn't look at that either. But uh, both of you mentioned the disdain that was shown by the French and the Germans for uh, Mrs. Thatcher in the early 80s. And I couldn't help reading that bit of the book, thinking about how the parallels with how um, Theresa May was, was treated. I mean, I've been as critical as anybody about the way Theresa May handled the, the negotiations, some of the people around her, but I thought the disdain with which she was treated uh, and the very obvious wish of the some in the EU anyway to kind of you know, ignore British political developments, just wait and see if they could shape events to their advantage, not take British politics seriously and the drivers of it. That, that really had an echo for me of what we, we experienced in that time. And I think it shows that there's something fundamental in the way uh, the EU works and looks at us. And that's why, in the end, it was the right decision to take the decision that we did. So I'll stop there. Thank okay, you. Thank you. <laughs>
where Britain was explicitly excluded from ever closer union, explicitly excluded from having to bail out the Eurozone, could have become a, a, a basis on which um, some of the other people who had not been part of the original six and some of the other new members would have based their membership. I think it was always a mistake to believe that, as it were, only the Pope was, um, was infallible, that the Europe, rather like Christianity, is made up of many different themes, and it was a mistake to think that only the most papal of them was the correct one. <coughs> uh, well, just quickly, I mean, no doubt, personally, that if there had been referendums sooner, we would have left sooner. I, I remember having a bet with a senior official in the Commission in the mid-90s that, that Britain would have left the EU within 10 years, and obviously it didn't work out like that, but it shows it was part of the, um, uh, the sort of bloodstream of people who were watching these things, even at the time. I, 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 I just don't see how we would have avoided a referendum defeat and, and leaving at any point. After all, it happened across Europe elsewhere. If it happened out there in France, in Denmark, in Ireland, for sure it would have happened here. So I think that's the inevitable result. Um, your second question, I don't think it is that difficult to identify what Brexit means, to be honest. Um, it, it has a lot of complicated consequentials, but Brexit means being a nation state in charge of your own affairs. And that, that raises some difficult questions for how you made that work in practice, but I don't think there's a conceptual difficulty. And elsewhere in the world, you don't find that being so controversial a concept. If you go to North America or Southeast Asia, the idea that you're a nation state running your own affairs is perfectly normal. It's only in Britain that we think that is a complicated, in Europe, that we think that is a complicated thing to get to grips with and requires lots of sort of specialists to, to deal with. I, I just don't buy it, really. Any other? Do I see anyone else? Just a query for you, Chris. Well, uh, 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 yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that I, I don't totally agree with Christopher. Uh, the theme of the book that, that sovereignty at the beginning would have made all that much difference. I, I said that the pro-Europeans were divided between those who saw it as the end of the older generation, uh, stopping repeat of the war, and secondly, uh, uh, those who thought they saw it entirely in terms of free trade. Uh, my generation, certainly personally myself. Uh, I saw it as a way of modernizing Britain and joining the modern world and restoring our position in the world. It was, uh, Suez had a big effect on opinion at the time. We had just been humiliated. Uh, our existence after the war had been, uh, had been as a satellite state of the United States, uh, still with the old imperial pretensions with the old imperialists in the party believing the Commonwealth was going to effectively going to give us the same role in the world as it had before, but just with a different title. Uh, people like me saw our, uh, we were falling economically behind. The continental powers were more economically successful than us. They were more modern than us. We could enhance our power by joining them. Uh, Britain was particularly not that proud or self-conscious about its sovereignty at the time. And this was a, a for the young, the new, uh, certainly conservative pro-Europeans, this was a new dawn that would bring us into the modern era and increase our political power. And it wasn't totally obscured at the time. Um, Heath, one of the phrases he always used was that it's a political project. He did, he did that wing campaigning. Uh, and, uh, but nobody was rightly interested in getting out of him very much more. Uh, 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 and we, everybody argued at the time in terms of the economic consequences and was it going to be a capitalist plot and uh, all, all this sort of thing. Um, as for referendums, we would have won a referendum easily, as Harold Wilson realised. And in order to get his party to stop being so completely divided and to oust the left, which he had, like most Labour leaders, he had spent most of his time trying to do, he called a referendum and thrashed them, with the help, of course, of huge numbers of Tory voters who joined with him. A referendum wouldn't have been a problem, and as Howard Wilson used it very skillfully, unfortunately, uh, Cameron was somewhat out of touch with the angry, protesting mood of the electorate when he tried to use a, a referendum in a 
a similar way. Most politicians regard the idea of holding referendums on such complex subjects as an utterly farcical way of trying to run a country. Can I just a uh, final uh, question from me, really? I think you touched upon an interesting thing. Sovereignty didn't seem to, the electorate didn't seem to mind it, for example, in the case of NATO, Ken, but they did mind it in the EU. I, just because we have a distinguished uh, Labour statesman, Lord Robinson, I saw earlier in the audience. I used to they they don't know what it means. George. The idea we're not a sovereign nation if we can't have our own regulations on the uh, fuel consumption of washing machines uh, is lost. And we re promptly renegotiated all the previously European trade relations we had with countries, which are absolutely full of constraints. All trade deals constrain sovereignty. The underlying point is you agree common standards and you renounce national standards, which are not the equivalent of those apply in the country you're trading with. It, it's a, a, it's a, it's just raised to, to, to a sort of jingoist thing in, in my extremely, I quite accept, still extremely biased opinion. I, I'm a believer in the George, European did country. you want to come in at all on this, on the difference between NATO sovereignty and EU? You played a part in both debates inside the Labour Party um, through many years. Just interested in it, any... It seems to me that this, uh, this is a non-discussion, really. We didn't give up any sovereignty in being part of the European Union. We were part of it and we played a big part and a big role in it and we could have continued uh, to do that, you know. So, <clears throat> your Christopher makes a number of points. Uh, I've recently been writing about Labour's role in, uh, and Labour's history as well, which is just as checkered in many ways. But the Delors speech actually was a turning point uh, for the Labour Party, just as Mrs. Thatcher was moving in one direction the Labour Party moved in another direction. And if Jeremy Corbyn had bothered to campaign during this last referendum campaign, there would have been a very different result. Gisela, last uh, thought from you, since uh, <laughs> the theme of to have ladies having the last word after, as Ken has described, the dismissive, and David describing the dismissive attitudes towards both Margaret Thatcher and Theresa May uh, subsequently. Yes, there, there, there's a bit of a problem. Uh, but I just want to make a, a, a point on, on, on the sovereignty issue. If, 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 if I'd wanted sovereignty to operate properly, my argument would have been we required European elections which had pan-European political parties because we, we elected a European parliament on national tickets. We had no idea what the Party of European Socialists did, but the one thing which we did know is that the EPP, which was the greatest conservative group, had a completely different policies from... from so so if, you, if you really want to, to anchor that sovereignty, you would have party manifestos which would have delete buttons so you can change laws. So to me, the sovereignty is about that any given set of people who are in charge can, by a process of exercising universal franchise, on the basis of a political manifesto which crystallize a body of ideas can be changed and altered. What we had, on the other hand, was one where neither the political parties had cohesion, nor the process by which you arrived at the decision had cohesion, and you had a court that actually was entrenching things rather than ever challenging things. So I'm not saying it would not have been possible. I'm just saying that none of the things which happened in the last 30 years in the trajectory were going in a way which made me confident it would actually become a structure. Uh, and just want to say one thing. I'm one of the few people who, who, ask, who think federalism is not an F word. I grew up in a world where federalism was actually supposed to be weakening the center, give more power to things. These are perfectly possible, but it requires certain conditions which just weren't there. So the last 50 years may have been quite turbulent, the last five years even more turbulent. But actually, I think on balance, we're going in the right direction. Thank you. I'm sorry to anyone disappointed today. We've uh, had a wonderful discussion over our time. Just to conclude by thanking Christopher Tugendhat for making everything possible today. Copies of his most significant work are there at the back. Please buy it, read it, discuss it further, and look forward to welcoming you all back here in future. And thank you to all our panelists for their most uh, welcome contribution today. Thank you.